da, 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 da. <laughs> Jerry Ellsworth, will you please come up and do your presentation? Now, something we do have, and is it working? Do you have a microphone? Um, we have okay, okay. Afterwards, if you want to ask Jerry any questions after she's done, we have a microphone. Keep it nice now. <laughs> All right, Jerry, AI6PK. Thank you, thank you. Can I get the handheld mic so I can do my nervous uh, prance back and forth? <laughs> huh? Oh, there goes my PowerPoint. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so first I'm going to start off and kind of give you a little background on myself. Uh, folks have told me that I'm uh, kind of unique, and I think that comes from my unique background. Um, and it starts with uh, my father, who is probably my most influential uh, mentor. And, and my talk's going to be a lot about mentors and how ham radio operators were my mentors and other very interesting mentors. But um, I was kind of thrust into this world in a very unique way. Um, my father uh, met my mother in Georgia when he was there working a, apparently a fairly lucrative job um, doing plywood inspecting. Um, unfortunately, she fell sick after I was born, and she, uh, she passed away um, when I was only one year old. And so my father traveled quite a bit for his uh, work, and so he uh, had to put me in daycare and then travel for five days, and then when he came back, I would cry and I would be upset, I didn't recognize him, and then he would spend a weekend with me, and then he would hand me over to the... Um, to the lady that was going to take care of me, and apparently I would cry, and, and um, it was tearing him apart. So he quit his job and moved back to Oregon to be close to my grandmother so that he could spend more quality time um, with me. And uh, so, so he took a job in a little town out by Dallas Independence area in Oregon. It's in the middle of nowhere, really. Um, just do it as an auto mechanic, so at a, a greatly reduced pay and uh, just to, to raise me. And uh, so that's what he did for quite a while and he was saving his money. And uh, one of the first memories I have when I was probably four or five years old was when he decided to open his own business, his own gas station and service station business, which was really difficult. And I remember how difficult that was for him because he had saved up all the money he had and uh, opened this, this store or this business. And, um, but I think that was really interesting because I got to see like, him be an entrepreneur at a very young age. And uh, as I got a little bit older, I, uh, I had this kind of like, innate like, desire to understand how everything worked. And so, you know, as, as soon as I was old enough to grab a screwdriver, I started taking everything apart. And, yeah, everything. Um, I just visited my father a few weeks ago, and he reminded me of a story, and it, it all came, like, flooding back to me. I must have been five or six years old, and he decided he needed to replace the oven in, his, in the house, the stove. And somehow I got into his tools, and the stove was sitting out back, and I managed to take all the screw, screws out of the panels, pull all the burners out and start to dismantle this thing. And I, after he told me this, I had this like very visceral like memory of like kind of the rancid grease that was in this like push button switch. And but it was so delightful taking that apart. <laughs> um, and uh, it got to the point where he stopped um, buying me toys because I would take them all apart. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes I take stuff that wasn't uh, toys apart. Like I was, I was in inside of our VCR at a pretty young age too. Um, so he had this service station, and he's trying to get it up off the ground and, and going. And so, and he he saw this desire that I wanted to understand how things work. So we put a box out in front of his gas station. It says, "Bring your broken electronics." Yeah, and every like few weeks or so, he'd bring boxes home that had like a toaster or an AM, FM radio or just a bunch of broken stuff, and I would completely dismantle 
all this electronics, and I just needed to know what was going on inside of it. Um, it was kind of funny, as I think back about it, um, I didn't know anything about electronics at the time, maybe six or seven years old, but I would take all the components and I would wiggle them back and forth and break them off the board. And so I had my resistor collection, and they all had no leads on them because I'd broken the leads off. I, I, I found some pictures of some uh, MELF uh, resistor parts up here. I want to claim that I invented MELF parts uh, very early on when I was young. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to dismantle these parts and get the uh, components off of uh, the circuit boards. And I remember the, besides some of the parts you couldn't um, wiggle and break off, and I found my dad's file. And I found that you could file the back of the circuit board and file all the solder off and then eventually pop the parts off. <laughs> I eventually progressed more. I started to learn more. I found out about soldering. Like, there's this thing called soldering. And so, but my dad wouldn't give, like, an, probably a seven or eight-year-old at this time a soldering iron. So I found that if I took a, um, one of these AC wall warts that you plug into the wall and you hook it up to a wire-wound resistor, it gets really hot. <laughs> And so, you know, I'm soldering stuff. Didn't know what I was doing. Um, one day, my father came in and found burns on the carpet. And I tried to, you know, just kind of hide this, but he, he pried it out of me. He's like, you know, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I just needed to solder, and here's how I do it. And he made me show him. He's like, super dangerous. Um, he also... Like, he was really trying to encourage me to, to learn about um, technology. And one day he brought home this big carousel of automotive light bulbs and a bunch of D-cell batteries and showed me how to tape them together with duct tape, stick some wires on it, and then hook them up to the, these 12 and 6 volt lights and light them up. I had so much fun. I'd just stack it up. and I burned most of them out intentionally because it was cool. You know, you <laughs> stack a bunch of batteries together, like way past their rating, and then you, you light them up, and then they turn silver inside. And I thought that was really cool. <laughs> um, there were some other things that happened with those light bulbs, too, that uh, my father didn't approve of. Uh, I mean, the little screw-in bases on these, or the bayonet bases, look like big, regular 110-volt light bulbs, right? So I took my desk lamp, and I figured, if I could just drop this in properly and get it to touch those contacts. So I have some really vivid memories of dropping this light bulb in and showers of sparks in my room. And then there goes the fuse. And of course, I'm trying to hide this from my father because I'm embarrassed. Um, unfortunately, it like you know, the old house, the, the wiring was half hooked between the kitchen and my bedroom, so we figured it out pretty quick. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I got in a little bit of trouble with that. Um, but pretty early on, I got into shortwave listening. Um, I, I think this is about the type of radio that I, I got given to me at some point. I found it very, very fascinating. Like some of the first things I ran into was WWV, WWV, the time signals out there, and like strange signals in Morse code. It was uh, it was really amazing. And I started to learn about antennas. I started like stringing wires out of my bedroom and just dropping them on the ground. And didn't know that you had to get them in the air, but uh, it was started enhancing the uh, the reception. So. At a very early age, I got into um, curiosity on radio, at least. Um, at one point, uh, we were, you know, visiting one of my friends, or one of the family friends, and they had a TI-99 4A computer. And, yeah, really, really neat. Um, and they showed it to me, and they let me just play around with the thing. And so I was sitting in their back room by myself, and they just flip it on, and it had a ready prompt on there, and I was like, hmm, draw house, syntax here, paint house, syntax here, make house, syntax here. But I was hooked. I just sat there for hours, just keying things in, eventually showed me this book that you could use to uh, um, 
program and, and enter some uh, some uh, basic programs, and I was completely hooked. And so I started begging my father for a computer. And so he took me to the stores back when the this is uh, early '80s, like 1983 or so. This is when the computers were just all lined up in the store, and they were just turned on at the basic prompt. And so I went down and looked at every one of them, and uh, I uh, saw the VIC-20, and it had these really big letters, it, not the little tiny letters that were on this, like TI-99-4A. But my father decided that um, he was going to get the Commodore 64 instead, and uh, he was going to get it as a present, and he... he uh, he bought it before some holiday or something, or maybe my birthday, and had it hidden in his uh, bedroom, but I discovered it months in advance. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, since my father was just a solo parent, I would come home from school and I'd be, you know, by myself, so I'd carefully pull this thing out of the box, carefully hook it up to the TV, you know, and program it on, on it a little bit, and knew he would be coming home about 7 o'clock and put it back in the box and hide it back away. <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't know, maybe he didn't actually know or not, but I pretended when he actually gave it to me to be super surprised, and he must have thought that I was amazing on it, like an amazing learner, because... <laughs> um, some of this stuff is going to be not in chronological order because it just overlaps, but um, there was a lot of interesting things that um, happened with the, uh, the computer. Um, I, wanted, I heard about online bulletin boards, and I wanted to do this, um, but my father wouldn't let me have a phone at the time. So I ended up building my own phone, <laughs> running wires surrepti surreptitiously through... Um, the wall and out to the junction box outside. And uh, I actually did it with one of those uh, 101 kits. You remember those from Radio Shack? Yeah, so I actually used a Morse code key to dial. And I hated my friends that had zeros in there. You... Yeah, you guys know that? <laughs> it was a very advanced phone. I had to scream into the speaker for them to hear me. Uh, eventually, in like all this junk that I was getting, like in people are dropping off, there was an old broken phone. I managed to fix it, so I took the the ringer, the, um, the bells out of this old uh, princess phone thing, and uh, had my own little secret phone in my room. And eventually, um, through a bunch of trading, I ended up um, getting a 300 baud modem for my my Commodore, and uh, started sneaking onto BBSs. Uh, eventually, uh, my father came into my room one day, and I had this phone shoved under my bed, and the bells were moved, but the, you know, when the clacker went back and forth, it, it's a distinctive sound, even though there were no bells, so I was busted. <laughs> uh, from there, I was able to, you know, prove that I was responsible. I was probably maybe 10 years old at the time, and uh, he let me get a fancy 1200 baud modem. You know, that could dial on its own. Ooh. And so what's the first thing I do with it? I war dial the entire uh, area code. <laughs> so when I was preparing for the talk today, I was like, you know, I discovered a lot of really interesting things when I war dialed because I wasn't smart enough to program the computer to turn the speaker off. So I'd sit there and it would just dial one number at a time, just sequentially through the, the phone book. And it was mostly people like, hello, hello, <laughs> click, and then it dial the next person, hello, hello. But there were some very strange numbers I found. There were some open, uh, 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 like, diagnostic things for gas stations that you could see the level of fuel in there and stuff. But I found there was a whole bank of, of payphone numbers, which were very interesting and very use, uh, useful when I wanted to prank my friends. So I would go over to my friend's house and say, like, I need to call my dad, can I use your phone? And they'd be like, sure. And then I would play this. I'd dial this number. This call requires a coin deposit. Please hang up momentarily, then redial your call by first depositing a local rate posted on the instruction card. Or dial zero. And then I would say, haven't you guys paid your phone bill? 
<laughs> I'm really surprised those phone numbers still work. I can't, I can't imagine there's a payphone in the world that's still like in operation out there. <laughs> and at this point I was learning quite a bit about electronics, and so I started making some interesting kind of phone freaking circuits. And so my friends knew I had this like extraordinary power over the phones, but they didn't exactly know how. So I made this really cool triac circuit that could pick the phone up before they could even hear the first ring on their side. And then it would switch a relay on that would turn on my tape recorder that would play back a message. So I'd call my friends up, I'd do some like crazy thing to prank call them, and they would try to call me back, and of course I'd flip in the circuit, and it wouldn't even ring, and then it would play back, this phone number's been disconnected. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like yeah, I, I can just turn off phones at any time. <laughs> uh, a lot of other fun stuff I found, like we had a really old kind of exchange in our, um, in our uh, area, it was mechanical for the longest time. I could call people and like just squat on their, um, their line and, let, and just be sitting there. And I could actually sense this, so I made a little circuit that I could just call them up, squat on their line, and then just wait for them to pick it up, and then I'd be like, hello? Hey, why are you calling me? <laughs> uh, and then also I found that if I, at the time I picked up an old CB radio and it had a PA output, and I found if you just hook that straight into the phone lines and just key up right into it, it gets really loud on the other side. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I ended up uh, frying our phone line. And then, again, I had to go to my dad. I'm like, I just don't know what happened. The phone just quit working. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> and when they, they, he called the phone company from his gas station and got the phone fixed. And uh, when it fixed it, it was kind of like half-crossed with our neighbor's phone from that point on, which was really unfortunate because you could hear them lightly in the background. I was trying to use my computer to call BBSs, and they made a phone call. It, it uh, messed up the um, communication, which was really a downer. So I guess, you know, it's penalties for uh, screwing around with phones like that. Um, so I'm living in this little tiny town and it's a few thousand people there, and I'm an oddball that likes electronics, and there's not a lot of resources. This is way before internet, and like even the stuff you could get off BBSs was just dodgy anyway. And so I'm hanging out at the library, and um, looking at the like four books on electronics they had there that I probably read ten times, I and I ran into one of my first mentors. He was a ham radio operator. And so uh, he took me under his wing and started like teaching me about electronics in a more um, disciplined way. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, up to this point, the best I had was like electronics, like either scra scrounge out of stuff I got at a, a garage sale, or was like given to me, uh, you know, in these like junk boxes or the Radio Shack in town. Um, but they started giving me some of my first tools. Like I had one of these old Heathkit oscilloscopes. It was amazing. It only had a few hundred kilohertz bandwidth on it, but it was like better than nothing. Um, frequency generators, so I could like figure out like you know the resonance of particular um, circuits. A grid dip meter. Like who's used a grid dip meter? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, trying to make uh, tank circuits back in the good old days. You know before. You know, you had all these modern tools, like grid dip meter was like my go-to tool. I still like every once in a while I pull it out and use it, and especially take it to work. And like, hey guys, take a look at this thing. Like, uh, what's the resonance of this microphone uh, boom here? Um, I got one of these 150 in one and a 200 in one kit, and I just had this fond memory of uh, Christmas Day when I got one of those kits and burning the LEDs out immediately in it and smelling that. Um, and out of that, they had in, one of these 151 kits had an AM transmitter project in it. And that was uh, the start of a lot of shenanigans. Um, so I, I built a little transmitter and started transmitting just kind of around the house at just like fractions of a milliwatt. And then I ran into a kid up the street who was also building little transmitters. He was about a quarter mile up the road. You know, like, oh, you like transmitters? I think it's pretty cool. Let's see how far transmitters can transmit. 
And so we started off with like single trans transistor transmitters on the AM band, and we'd ride our bikes, and we'd count the number of phone poles from our house, and that was our kind of measurement, and whoever could transmit the furthest, you know, would win. And then the next weekend would come along, we'd work on our transmitter all week, and then we'd maybe transmit a little bit further. It became this arms race between us. And this went on for several years. And uh, it got to the point where we were using tubes. So I was going to uh, um, garage sales and getting these little six tube AM radios, which chuck full of all kinds of great parts to uh, uh, transmit on the AM band. And uh, it got to the point where we were transmitting so far that in, the, uh, in an afternoon, we couldn't ride our bike far enough. It's like we were just... Um, so we switched to the FM band. <laughs> and so that was fun, you know, a little more challenging. And uh, we just kept, like, pumping the power up, pumping the power up. And the one thing I was never able to do that he beat me is uh, he was able to do full stereo on his transmitter, and I never managed to do it. Yeah. He probably did cheat, jerk. <laughs> <laughs> And about this time, I got into CB radios. Yeah. Boo hiss. <laughs> yeah, CB radios were pretty fun. I mean, it was, uh, you know, mid-80s to coming on late 80s. So the big fad had already passed, but there was still lots of activity. And all of us kids in town started getting CB radios. There were no cell phones, so that's how we communicated. And it was super, super fun. We all had our handles, and it was... Uh, you know, we were up to no good on the, the radio all the time. I figured out how to open. This is like the Sears version of the base station I acquired somewhere along the way. I figured out how to boost the power on it by like cranking the power supply up. So I was super happy about that. Uh, I, going into junior high, I was uh, pretty excited about space and everything space related. And so I got into the rocketry club. Um, started, we got a C-band satellite dish at home, which was really cool, and uh, got into uh, figuring out how to de-scramble. Uh, yeah, anyone de-scramble video out there? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I never got the video cipher 2 all the way, but I got a bunch of the other ones, like the first run decoder. Um, so, I, it was super popular with my friends, we'd come over and watch all the first run movies for free. Yeah, I'm super proud of that. I actually used parts from an echo microphone from a CB radio to descramble the first run decoder. So they, the way they did the audio scrambling, they just inverted the video, they left the sync alone, and I, that was easy to fix the video. But the audio up in the vertical blanking period, there's just some indicators of how the audio gets shifted back and forth. And so the bucket brigade that was in one of these echo microphones had multiple taps on it, so I just had an analog switch that would choose the correct... Yeah, uh, orientation of the audio and put it back together. And it was kind of fun. You would kind of, it would be all out of sync. You'd have to kind of bump your oscillator to get it synced up. And once it was synced up, it would stay synced up for like 20 or 30 minutes. Then you'd have to re-sync it back up. <laughs> um, yeah, I ended, ended up building my own satellite dish when I got into high school. And so that was uh, quite a novelty with the uh, high school shop teacher. <laughs> I, he, it took a long time to convince him to let me to do let me do it, but uh, I worked with the math teacher to figure out how to uh, do parabolic arcs, and we made these you know wood templates, and I bent all the ribs, and I did the uh, azimuthal uh, positioner thing, and and uh, ended up working out. It was pretty fun. So I had my own satellite dish because um, you know back then you had to share it with the rest of the family, which kind of sucked. <laughs> Um, uh, some stories around rocketry. I always love rocketry, and that kind of f uh, feeds into some stuff that was that just happened this last year, which is um, going to be fun and exciting. But um, oh, I got into rocketry in junior high, and they only let us do these little tiny A engines. They just whoosh, and they're nothing, right? Not exciting at all. So I decided to make a double stage rocket. So A engine on the bottom, D engine at the top, and kind of be very carefully hide the seam. So we go to our junior high launch, put it on the launch pad, it goes part way up the rod, gets hung up because it doesn't have enough uh, thrust, kind of tips to the side, separates to, into the D engine, hits the top roof of the school and goes off into Never Never Land. And, 
I was never allowed to launch a rocket again at school. <laughs> So, you know, I'm a kind of a nerdy kid, and, uh, you know, nerdy kids don't, um, don't uh, get along with the popular kids at school. So I went through this phase where I was picked on a lot. So by the time I was, uh, like, second year in junior high and freshman in, in high school, I was being brutalized by um, all the popular kids. It was terrible. And uh, I was a really nice kid, and I just... My father had always taught me to, like, I'm going to drop a, an F-bomb, but I don't care. He's like, fuck them, you know. <laughs> if they're picking on you, they're going to leave someone else alone. Just, like, let it roll off. And, you know, for the, the longest time, that's what I, uh, I tried to do. And, uh, but they just brutalized me. And it, it all came to a head one day. Was it, Walking in the front of this class, I had one of some big book, like a math book or something, and this kid that had been picking on me, like, tried to trip me, and I just snapped. And I took this book like you would throw a discus, wham, right across his head. He flipped out of his chair onto the ground just as the teacher walks in. <laughs> uh, you know, zero tolerance uh, school, so... I, I, I just remember he had me by my arm, and I don't think my feet touched the ground as he drug me to, the, audit, to the, um, the principal's office, and I ended up getting suspended. I felt really bad about it, you know, but my dad was really supportive. He's, he understood I was going through a lot, of, a lot of problems, and I did my week off of suspension. <laughs> Played with my computer the entire time, so it wasn't too bad. And uh, um, when I came back, all of a sudden, I had this new respect. It's like, wow. All the bad kids were coming up to me and saying, like, you're pretty cool. <laughs> and so, <laughs> men sometimes mentors aren't always the good people, right? And um, I got a little bit of mentoring from the bad kids. And I learned from them that if you're a little wild and crazy, that's sometimes a good thing. And so I fell in with the bad kids, and we were constantly in trouble. And um, the kind of punk, I mean, the, the popular kids left me alone. And uh, I, I got into the whole goth thing, you know, like dyeing my hair like really dark and dark eyeliner and just being, just trying to be over the top. Um, but I fell into, as a dare from a friend, they said, you should join theater. And... Um, so I'm kind of this edgy kid going into theater, and I found a community that accepted me as I was, which was really cool. And working with the theater was amazing. Some other mentors came into my life at that point. I started working part-time with someone that was associated with the, uh, the theater. You know, she would donate her time, and she had me come by her house and help her do tasks around the house. And she was a very fascinating woman, a very strong woman, that uh, when she was um, in the military in World War II, she came up with the proper way to train military men to recognize the outline of airplanes in a rapid, um, rapid way. And, and she had all these techniques that she would run the, the military personnel through, you know, outlines of the, the airplanes. And then she would slip in an outline of a woman in there. And of course, all the guys are like, oh, a woman, right? And she would tell me these stories. And then she also would, at the time I wasn't really appreciating it, but she would take me to the side when I was at her house and she would make sure she sat down with me every, every time. And she'd pull open the, the newspaper and she's like, the, the, the latest uh, story, and she's like, all right, let's read this. So what, are your, what do you think's going on behind the scene? What's the optics that someone's trying to achieve with this? Like there's always something behind this story, so think about that. And she really, like, emphasized that. And also my theater teacher as well was very progressive for our, uh, our little tiny conservative town. And she was always pushing, pushing me to, like, be myself. Um, and there was an interesting situation where we were doing a production of I Never Saw Another Butterfly, which is about just some horrific stuff that happened during World War II. And... Um, we had a poster that we had to design for it, and we had to come up with a, a poster that 
evoked emotion. And so I put together this poster that had some imagery on it, which was provoked emotion, big time. And we put this around town. We started hanging these posters. And we did not anticipate what was going to happen. It just caused this whole firestorm. And I was in the center of it, and I didn't expect it to happen. And Megan, the, the woman that did the stuff in World War II, our theater teacher, um, really instilled, like, hang on to your belief systems, no matter how much pressure is like being applied on you. And, and it was terrifying for me. I had to go in front of the school board. I had to, like, there were angry parents there. Turns out like it all got diffused and it was one of the more people came to that production than in the, the entire history. It was amazing. It was a, a scary but amazing experience. So I'm really thankful for mentors that take time like that. Um, I just found out recently um, I reconnected with my theater teacher and apparently th in theater I had made a um, player piano that actually all the keys moved you know, with little solenoids and it had this scroll and it was like kind of shrunk down for the music man and I also made a couple other props like a mechanical chicken that one time uh, lost control and, and flew off the stage into the audience. Anyway, I, I found out that they have a dedicated area for all my props and that that poster is there and they don't let any of the students mess with it. It's like, wow, it's amazing. So, you know, mentors come, you know, when you don't expect them and most of the time you don't recognize that they're mentoring you. <clears throat> so I'm going through my wild phase. Um, I'm in high school trying to find more and more wild things to do. And uh, my father had raced cars at one point. And so I thought that was pretty darn cool. So I started begging my father, and at this time I'm working at his gas station pumping gasoline, and he's teaching me how to work on cars. I could change oil, I could lap valves, I could change head gaskets, I could do it all. I'm like, Dad, I want you to build me a race car. And he's like, nope, not going to do that. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, come on. And for months and months, I'm like, Dad, will you you know, build the car. He's like, no, 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 you're not going to race. And he, finally, I broke him down and he said, there's only two ways that you're going to be able to race. Either you're going to build one yourself or you're going to figure out a way to raise enough money to buy one. And I'm like, I know how to build things. So <laughs> I, uh, I started working on my master plan to build my first race car. And so went out and found a bunch of information. I started going to the race track, the local oval quarter mile dirt track, and started just like buying pit passes going into the pit area with a tape measure. <laughs> Freaked out the drivers down there. I'd like crawl under their car and <laughs> Started to find out there's some like books and magazines and stuff out there. And uh, but I didn't know how to weld, I didn't know how to bend metal, I didn't know much about like fabricating. I built the satellite dish, but that was pretty simple construction compared to a race car. And so I'm like, I started to figure out what mentors were back then. I'm like, I need to find someone that I can that will teach me this stuff. So I started going to the local machine shops. So it's a kind of logging town I come from. So there were quite a few little machine shops that would uh, repair equipment. So I went to the Finally found this one machinist, it's just a solo guy in his machine shop, really grumpy, always grumpy. And he's like, yeah, I'll teach you, but you have to come in on the weekends and you're going to work for it. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll come in. And uh, so come in on the weekends and he had me crawling in the bed of his lathe and like cleaning chips up and greasing the, you know, the, the ways and adjusting gibs and and in exchange, he would spend an hour or so on a Saturday and like teach me how to like weld or tap a hole. And um, he was an amazing mentor because even though he was super grumpy and yelled at me a bunch, I could tell. And that this is where I started to become more savvy about how to work with mentors. It's like there's this feedback loop. You know, if you're hungry and you want to just consume all the information they have, they'll gladly go above and beyond and give it to you. And so he would actually lose money letting me be in the shop. Like, he would let me spin the lathe up at such a high speed and try to run a tap into a hole or something. He knew it was going to break. I could almost see it in his eyes. He's like, 
it's got this you know shitty grin on his face that he's gonna you know and I run this tap in and it just like explodes and he's like ah oh, god damn it <laughs> yeah, you seem kind of chuckling uh, amazing mentor but you know I started to learn all the fun fundamentals it took me like about a year and a half and I built my first race car and uh, so I go out to the track and by this time my father is on board he's like wow this is serious and so <laughs> He actually helped me build the motor, so I built this 383 small block Chevy, you know, ground all the reliefs so that the crank and the rods could clear. It was an amazing experience, like this bonding experience with my father, bonding experience with this grumpy machinist, and just all kinds of people helping me out. And I, I take the, the race car out to the track for the first time, and, and I teenager, I think that I'm going to like set a world record with this thing, just right, <laughs> so naive. Um, and I'm so late in the season that I didn't, don't even have a chance to go to a test and tune day. So I just like, show up at the track, roll this thing off the trailer, and um, like right into qualifying. And so I go out there, and I'm like going around the track, and I'm like, I'm going so fast, oh my goodness. And I come in, and I look at where I like, fall, and I'm like, slow time of the night by a lot. <laughs> like, oh, by a lot. Like, you know, four seconds slower than everyone else, that is... So, anyway, I get, I get into my first race, and uh, dirt track racing is really interesting because they invert the race where the slow cars are up front and the fast cars are in the back. They like crashes. Yeah. So, I'm like four seconds slower than everyone else, and I'm in the front. And so, race starts, and people are like, zoo, 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 zoo. I'm like, ah, I'm like crazy. And uh, I'm like cruising around a couple laps and people are starting to lap me and I like lose control in the corner and I'm like spin out in the corner and here comes this car like heading right towards me and I just like close my eyes. <laughs> and it's like thud. And I open my eyes like, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> and so that was my racing uh, start. Um, so I just kept at it, did terrible the first year. Um, when I built the car, I found this book and there was a phone number in the back of the book. So I started pestering the guy that wrote this book. Probably, like, Gordo, you should never put your phone number in a book. <laughs> <laughs> People like me will be calling you. So this, this gentleman, Duke, he's like, I'm calling him, I'm calling him, and he's giving me lots of advice. It's pretty great. And he's like, you need lots of help. So, I live in Florida. If you can figure out a way to get here, you can spend a couple weeks with me and my wife and I'll teach you everything you need to know about racing. I'm like, I'm there. So, I, do, I save up some money. I get on a Greyhound bus from up by Oregon. Like, five day bus ride. Horrible. <laughs> Horrible. I get there. And I spend the first maybe like four or five days, and he teaches me like the, the very practical stuff, like this is the angle that you need this, you know, suspension piece, and this is the toe in and toe out, and just the mechanics of it and the dynamics of a race car. And he's like, okay, you know everything you need to know to be a, a, a technically to be a great race car driver, but he's like, now the psychology of winning is is what you need to learn and that's more important than like anything you can do to your car. So we spent the rest of the time just explaining the psychology of winning and uh, one of the things he taught was that if you can win over the audience then the promoters of the track like that because if the audience is cheering for you you'll get preferential treatment when the flagger flags because there's always like these situations where there's like a a questionable call, and if you have all the fans in the audience cheering for you, they'll just go a little more lenient on you. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing that he taught was, like, you need to give an appearance that you're more uh, equipped or more skilled than everyone else, even though maybe you're not. And he gave a lot of, like, tricks to do that. You, like, you can add stuff to your car that makes people think that you have an advantage. Or you can start some lore and like get people talking about like something you're doing special. And then he's like, subterfuge is great. Um, you know, just, just sling it out there like crazy. Um, and then 
the, the third thing was, if, if it's not in the rule book, then you should try to push on that and, and, and do it. <laughs> it gave a lot of different examples. So I came back, another five-day trip on a bus, supercharged, ready for the next season. And so I uh, started working all my subterfuge. So I started adding fake weights to my car. You ballast a car sometimes to make the weight and balance. So I started putting weight in funny places, <laughs> like up high and to the right. And it was just empty like blocks that looked like they were heavy, but they weighed nothing. Um, added brake lights to my car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turns out when you see brake lights, you slow down. <laughs> Uh, oh, people were pissed about that. <laughs> um, I got more and more advanced. I started winning a lot of races, so I started getting a bunch of trophies. And after a while, I got like five or six trophies, and they get kind of boring. And then, like, I remembered, like, you got to win the audience over. And like, how can I win the audience over? So every time I got a trophy, I would cross over the track and I'd go into the audience, and the first kid I saw, I'd give him my trophy. Yeah, instant fan. The kid was an instant fan. The whole family was an instant fan. It got to the point where even if I didn't win the race and I would cross over into the grandstands, I'd have like 100 kids approach me. And I was like crowd favorite. It was amazing. And it's true, you get preferential um, treatment, you know, when, because uh, the promoters like people coming and people coming drink a lot of beer and it means a lot of profit. <laughs> Um, I added my electronics to the cars. I made traction control systems. Yeah, that was cool. Um, that actually got banned. They, they were <laughs> yeah, I made this really clever traction control system that would trick my uh, engine control box into thinking that the engine was over revving when the back tires were spinning too much. And so the, the side effect of this, besides going incredibly fast, was that raw fuel was dumped into the exhaust and it would shoot out the side of my car and it just the audience loved it. So, oh my god, flame shooting out of my car. <laughs> I can go on and on about race car stories. I better move on because we gotta some of us have to go to bed tonight. Um, so you know racing cars I made a lot of money at that. I was building cars, I was selling cars, I was making money as the purse. Um, I ended up dropping out of high school at this point, and I did that for five years, but it's a hard business. So um, I went over to one of my high school friend's um, house, like after he had graduated, and he showed me this 486 PC that he built. This is about 1995. He's like, I had tricked the wholesaler into giving me the parts wholesale. Normally this is a $1,200 computer, and I bought it, bought the parts for $400. I'm like, Ooh, my entrepreneurial uh, side came out like that's a lot of profit, and uh, this was before Windows 95 came out. So I'm like, let's start a business. I'll sell off all my race car stuff, and we'll open this computer store together. And that's what we did, and it just exploded. Like people were buying computers like crazy to uh, get on their AOL and look at porn or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we're making tons and tons of money now. Remember, I'm still doing the goth thing. I'm really rough around the edges, like a swear word every five minutes out of my mouth at the time. I was hanging out at the racetrack, so I was really rough around the edges. And uh, my, my business partner did not like that, and so he ended up pushing me out of the business. And it was pretty traumatic for me that that happened. But you know, now that I look back, I'm more mature. It's like, okay, I can see why he had so much trouble with me. And so I was at my apartment, and I was really depressed, and I'm like crying, and like, I call my dad, I'm like, Dad, what should I do? And he's like, oh, yeah, just go back to school. You gotta go back to school, you can't move on from this. Oh, I'm really sad, and thinking about it. And then I got mad, like, he can't do that to me. And so, I took everything I had, I moved out of my apartment, I rented a little tiny, it was a one chair barber shop that was uh, um, just down the street from the sky. And I just took the barber chair out and threw it in the alley out back, and it disappeared at some point. And I got just enough store fixtures to put some like shelves up, and I didn't have any money to buy product, so I went to his dumpster, took
took all the colorful boxes out of the dumpster, pulled them up, put them on the shelf. <laughs> Product. <laughs> And then people would come in and they'd be like, well, I want that sound card. And be like, well, that one's already spoken for. <laughs> but I can get you one here in like a week. And that's how I bootstrapped my company, <laughs> goth and all. Um, I was living in the back and I was just kind of limping along, limping along. And here's where another like very critical mentor came into my life. Across the street was an insurance salesman. And he saw me struggling and he would bring me lunch. And... He would sit there and we'd talk about computers or business, and he would start to make gentle suggestions. He's like, there's this thing called relatability. <laughs> and I, I did, trust me, I didn't want to hear a bunch of this, because this was my safety shield that I'd put up in high school. And it was, I thought it was still serving me, like even though I'm in my 20s. But slowly, he's, I trusted him. He was successful. And he's like, you know, you shouldn't swear so much. <laughs> you should maybe dress the part. You should, some lingo. You should, this is how you engage with customers. And I slowly started to adopt it. And then pretty soon sales started going up and up and up. Oh, wait, wait, I want to back up before this, this, the store, the, the sales go up. There was a mortifying moment for me, which was really humbling. So I'm living in the back. I have no money. I'm like probably weeks away from going out of business couldn't afford garbage service at the time, so I was taking all my garbage and dumping in all the neighbors' garbage cans. The police get called, and they show up. I'm working with a customer, and they come in, and they scold me in front of my customer, like, if you keep doing this, we're going to do bad things to you. And, uh, yeah, there, there was a lot of rough times. But then I figured it out with help from mentors. And sales started going up and up and up. I started. I hired my first people to work for me. It was amazing. We outgrew that space. Like people were out the door buying computers. I ended up opening another store and another store. And another. I ended up with five stores. And a lot of amazing things happened when I was there. Like I learned a lot about business and how to work with people. So bringing on your first employees, you just don't quite know how to do that. And so you make a lot of mistakes. Maybe you hire the wrong people. Um, but what happened was I quickly learned that the best people to hire in a computer store, at least, were these people that were so passionate about computers that they would be there on the weekends when you were closed, still, like, tinkering around. And so I just started targeting those people to bring in as my employees. And a lot of heartwarming things happened. We became, like, family. We would hang out. We would be there on the weekends playing games. And... One of the gentlemen that worked for us, he was like, you know, probably beard down to here. He never cut his hair. He was like holes in his jeans. And he was like a great tech. He was our best tech. I'd have to yell at him all the time, like, you cannot come in and work so much. I can't pay you for this. And he's like, oh, I'm just coming in for fun. One day, he's like, he had saw like all the excitement we were having up front selling stuff. He came in, he was like, completely shaved, hair cut, button up shirt. And he's like, I'm ready to sell. Yeah, amazing transformation. We're still like great friends. He's moved on to like an executive position and like this company. It's just what I learned there is so heartwarming and so valuable. Um, so things were pretty explosive in the, the 2000s, um, up until 2000. And then the computer store market collapsed. Like all the, the big companies shot themselves in the foot and cannibalized their own market. And uh, now we're selling computers, you know, normally we were making like $500 profit, now we're trying to survive on $75 profit. And so the whole family, the, all the employees came together and we started like trying to pivot the company, try to find ways to make the company survive. And uh, we just couldn't find a way to keep the company alive. And in 2000, I just gave the stores away to the employees. I'd lost all, almost all of my net worth trying to figure out how to make this um, computer store business work. And so I just, like, if you can pay me back in the future, great. You know, have it. And I just can't do this anymore. But during this entire time, I had been doing electronics and learning more about electronics and working with other ham radio operators. So actually, someone I was dating at the time, her grandfather was a ham radio operator. And so more um, like exposure um, to ham radio and learning about electronics. Oh, 
I forgot one of my favorite stories. I'm sorry this is so out of order, but you've got to hear this. Rewind. We're rewinding. Forget about the computer stores. Forget about the racing. We're going back. Ham radio operator tells me about the Polk County Fairground ham radio swap meet. Has anyone ever been to that? Yeah. So I'm probably like 12 or 13. I ride my bike like a long ways to get there. And I hang out there all day in the vendor room. I have like $10 in my pocket, like whatever I could scrounge up, and I just look at everything. What year? Uh, what year? That was probably 87, 88 or so. Okay. Just see a young redhead girl wandering around for hours and hours? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, amazing. I, I started going to this every year, but what was amazing about it was <laughs> I'd find the one or two things that I wanted to buy, and then at the end of the swap meet, all the guys would just give me tons of stuff. Like more than I could take back on my bicycle. So there's like a creek that runs out back. And I would shuffle all that stuff and hide it in the bushes. And for the, the next week, I would make this trip back and forth. <laughs> hauling, like these old military tube radios on my handlebars. Like There were a couple times I like fell in the whole... Yeah, anyway, okay, now let's fast forward back to the computer stores. All right, they're crashing. And uh, I gave them away. And amazingly, one of the computer stores lasted. It's, it may still be going. It was still there like two or three years ago. Um, warms my heart that they're still going. Um, so I took my last of my savings. Again, I like reached out to my dad. and like, well, the computer stores have completely collapsed. What should I do? And he's like, you should go back to school. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> so... Uh, I'd been wor working uh, with Mr. Sano, the, the ham radio guy, and he got me into a lot of pretty advanced stuff, like FPGAs. Um, that was pretty cool. And so I was making all these little FPGA boards, making circuit boards. And so I decided, bold move, I'm going to go take a part-time job at this electronic store in Salem, Oregon, you know, and work for minimum wage. And then I'm going to try to bootstrap my electronics career in Silicon Valley. So I started flying down to Silicon Valley. I had this deal with the, uh, um, the store owner that I would take, I could kind of take as much time off as I want. And so I started going down to Silicon Valley, meeting uh, entrepreneurs and getting lots of no's. And, and everyone I would run into, I'd show them my little circuit boards, like here's an FPGA that does video, here's a, like an op amp circuit, here's this and that. And not really getting a lot of traction, but I was getting a lot of traction at the electronics store which was problematic because um, I had all this sales experience plus I had this electronics experience. So I had lines out the door when I was there. People would come in and be like, is Jerry in? <laughs> and and uh, I was really good at upselling people on stuff too. They'd come in, they'd be doing some project and be like, well, do you have a battery box for that? How about some shrink tube? And, you know, and, and I would take a lot of interest in their projects. And so the store manager is like, old. <laughs> and he started like, well, you can't take so much time off. You need to be here. And uh, I ended up like, I quit. I just, if you're going to try to force me to come in, I quit. And uh, so then I had no income. And so I'm, I'm going back and forth to Silicon Valley. And pretty soon I can't fly there anymore because I'm running out of money. So back to the Greyhound bus. <laughs> oh my God. I never want to see a Greyhound bus again. The Creepers on a Greyhound bus. Oh my gosh. Um, so go, go down on, I'm going down on Greyhound buses and I, I finally make my first like true interview. And so I met this gentleman at like the Embedded Systems Conference and he's like, I really like your spirit. Come meet the team. Can you come down next week? I'm like, yeah, I can come down next week. Another Greyhound bus trip. <laughs> So I come down for the interview, I go into the interview, I, I make it like one or two interviews in, they're like, we're done. You know, it was pretty much like a very interesting resume, race cars, computer stores, and lots of like circuit boards, but where have you actually gone to school? And so I'm walking down out of the building down the stairs and I run into the founder of the company, he's like, where are you going? And I'm like, well, they said I was done. And they're like, what? Have you met any of the engineers yet? I'm like, I don't think so. And they're like, come with me. And so he took me upstairs 
gathered the entire team together and stuck me in the middle and, and just pretty much rapid fire asked me questions. And he's like, all right, we're hiring her. Yeah, my first real break. It was amazing. Like, and this was like after like dozens of trips down there with just flat out no's. And so I was bound and determined to do a really good job on this. And I did. I did a really good job on their design. And from there, I was able to springboard to my next thing. And I took it very, very serious. And every place I went, I looked for a mentor, someone that could teach me something. And, you know, is there a chip designer here? Like, I want to get into chip design. So I would hang out with the chip designers. And I would just do a kick-ass job on whatever I was hired to do. And I got this reputation the first three or four years I was working in Silicon Valley as becoming the ace like, if you needed someone to come in and get it done fast, call her. And so it really springboarded my career. It was great. And I got to do a lot of things. I eventually got into chip design. I did system level design, product design. And my, my breakaway success that kind of put me on the, the map was a toy. It's like this Commodore 64 joystick. Uh, I had been posting some stuff online about how I had been reverse engineering the Commodore 64 and putting it into a, an FPGA, and a toy company contacted me, and they're like, well, we've been trying to figure out how to do this, and there's just no way to emulate it, and it's like, you're doing this, and like, can you make us a custom ASIC to do this? And I had never done a custom ASIC before, and I'm like, yep, no problem. <laughs> so they're like, can you do it in eight months? Yep, no problem. <laughs> Uh, somehow, like lots of sleepless nights and a lot of like calling my mentors up, I did it. I pulled it off. I reverse engineered the whole C64, made it on a single chip. They, um, we didn't have much time. I was at the end of my eight months. And so they did a thing called a super hot lot where they just pushed a bunch of the wafers through without testing and sent them right to the factory. And uh, I get this phone call with this really angry New York guy. It's like, it doesn't work. And he's mad. And he, they've spent like millions on this chip design. I mean, millions on it. And, and I was seriously considering like, well, should I just like disappear off the face of the planet and move to Mexico? Because this was the, seemed like the biggest mistake of my life, like wasting that much money. And then he's like, you're going to China, you're gonna fix this, like, at, no matter what, you're going to fix it, go. And so next day I'm on, a, or next couple days, I'm on a plane to China and I get there and they open, they give me one of the toys and I open it up and I look at it and it's like, that's not the circuit board that I sent you guys. They'd relayed it out to make it cheaper, so they'd thrown away all the capacitors. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> and so I plug the thing in and I just touch the bottom of the circuit board and it lights up and turns on I'm like, Oh my goodness, uh, Guido's not going to come and uh, you know, <laughs> take care of me in the middle of the night. I can fix this. So we managed to fix it. Um, when I was at the factory, though, um, so I me and the programmers, we were all Commodore 64 fans. So we put a lot of Easter eggs in it. I put hardware in it so that you could hook a disk drive up to it. You could hook a keyboard up to it and download games into it or programs into it. The software guys had put extra games in it in secret menus, like one where you jump off a cliff and you have to like fall and like crack your head open on the rocks below perfectly. And the better you do it, the higher your points. And I had pictures of them drinking beer with famous programmers and stuff like that. And so one of the toy executives was there and I drop into one of these secret menus just to see if it works and he's like, what is that? And I'm like, oh yeah, we added a few things. Silence. And then, like, what? And then, like, you can't do that. I'm like, well, it's already kind of done. And they're like, this is really bad. This is really, really, really bad. Like, because there's, there's, I was so naive at the time, I didn't realize these things have ratings for, like, kids. And <laughs> having, like, games where you, like, crack your head open on rocks may, like, be a problem. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> you... You can't, you can't tell anyone about this. That's what they told me. And uh, so the guy I was dating at the time, well, I, I came back and I told the programmers and they were pretty scared and like, like, oh crap. 
And I go, well, I think we should just tell people anyway. We're not going to ever do this toy, this toy with these guys again. And we, the guy I was dating at the time, he's like, I can make a like backdated blog, make it look like it's someone else discovered it. And so <laughs> he made this whole backdated blog with, um, supposedly it was a worker in the factory in China that likes to hack on things. And... <laughs> But he made this whole thing, made it look really legit, and then uh, our actual, we were shipping the product through QVC, which is a strange outlet for this thing. And uh, so I'm like, yeah, pull the trigger, let's like get, let people know about this. And I didn't think it was going to go viral, I didn't even know what viral was at the time, it was way too naive. And uh, the... Uh, it hit Slashdot, which was popular at the time, and then all it just exploded. And then the phone calls came from the Mad New York guy, and he's like, "I'm going to sue you." I'm like, "Ooh, maybe I pushed it too far." I'm like really scared. And then the day that it launched on QVC, it's just like, bam! It's just selling like crazy. It's just selling, selling, selling. And and QVC is calling the toy guys, like, "What's going on? Like, why are 50 percent of these going overseas? We're only broadcasting this domestically." <laughs> <laughs> and so they had totally had a change of heart. They were really happy about it. And then when they did another production run, they actually put like instructions how to get into the secret menus, which kind of like <laughs> defeats the whole secret menu thing. <laughs> with these guys, I went on and did just dozens of designs with them. It was pretty cool. And uh, I just got approval before I put Easter eggs in uh, in the future. Um, and that, that put me on the, the map on the internet. And it was uh, pretty cool and kind of scary too, like having like tons of people approach me, like strangers, because I'd never had that kind of exposure online. And uh, from there I went into doing uh, chip design, I did like pretty advanced stuff, video compression, I did some consumer products, I did some products that were um, professional video encoders, like NewTek TriCaster, I uh, worked on, on robots, which was pretty cool. Um, that's a biped robot that was in the office that uh, where I worked. and. Uh, yeah, I feel very uh, fortunate that a thousand different things went right and uh, kind of launched my career and hundreds and hundreds of mentors along the way, like we had that virtuous feedback loop. <clears throat> um, I got into doing the video streaming boxes with New Tech, and so video streaming was kind of a new thing and YouTube was kind of a new thing and I really felt grateful for all the people that helped me along the way. And I thought that I need to understand streaming video because I'm working at a company that's doing it and I need to like give back. So I started a YouTube channel with some friends at first where we were just doing inventions. So every week we'd get together on Saturday, we'd make an invention and then Sunday we would stream it to the internet and let people watch whatever crazy thing we built. And uh, eventually that evolved into me doing um, really hardcore science in my garage. And so um, I, I put together this YouTube channel where I try to do things in my garage that people think are impossible and are interesting to me. So it can range from I got an electron microscope and explained how electron microscopes work and showed stuff on that. Go out hike in the middle of nowhere in Hawaii and shovel lava. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Our, our tour guide, when I went out, to, I'm like, I want to shovel lava. He's like, that's crazy. It'll just melt, the shovel. I'm like, I don't think so. I think it's okay. And so we hike out there, and I would just scoop it up and start uh, videotaping and exploring and, and uh, playing with it. Turns out that uh, the thing that surprised me the most about lava is that it's heavy. It's a rock. I don't know why I thought it should be fluffy like a marshmallow. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, and so I'm, I'm very proud of my work that I do on YouTube and that I can give back. And I, I get a lot of love coming back to me for that. And from that, it's also um, opened up opportunities for me as well. And so there's a company called Valve Software. Um, they fell in love with my YouTube channel and some of my user experience um, demos that I put together. I've been very fortunate to work with toy guys and consumer products people for many years and, and learned all these tricks about um, customer-facing 
uh, user experiences. And so they fell in love with all my um, discussion about that online, and they started stalking me. They're a, they're a big video game company out of Seattle, and they didn't do hardware at the time, but they wanted to get into hardware, and they needed someone to lead their, their group. And so at the time, <clears throat> they would just show up at random events. They probably would have shown up at this event to try to recruit me. And so they would just show up. I'd be doing a pinball uh, show. I collect pinball machines, and they'd just... This Valve software piece of person walked to the pinball machine next to me like, hey, Jerry, we're from Valve. <laughs> like, we want you to come work with us. And I'm like, I don't want to work with a software company. And then the next event, they'd show up. And finally, the founder of the company like, flew down to Portland, where I was living at the time. He's like, just let me take you out to lunch and like, try to persuade you. So I went out to lunch with him, and he's it's kind of like, we're kind of a big deal, and we're serious about this. Just come up and visit and uh, it was kind of a trap, very much like the, uh, my very first break. They, they brought me up to Washington, where they're based, and they stuck me in a room, and it was actually an interview, and they promised me it wasn't, but they brought in like 10 people, and they're just rapid fire, like, you're going to make a video game, game controller, how are you going to do that, and you're going to make a set-top box, you're going to make a VR system. Anyway, then uh, Gabe gives, the founder of the company gives the signal, and all of his guys get up and leave, and he's like, come with me, Jerry. And he takes me to the fourth floor of this building. He's like, this entire floor, we're remodeling it for you. And it's going to be yours. You have unlimited budget. You know, here's your mandate. Like, right now we only sell video games to hardcore gamers. I want to bring the whole family together in the living room. Grandma, grandpa, dad, grandkids. Playing games on our system. And he's like, are you interested? And I'm like... Let me think about it for a little bit. I go back. It's like, that's a pretty big mandate. Um, and I come back with this theory. Like, okay, if I'm going to do it, this is the way we're going to do it. We're going to have one-third makers, people that can build pro prototypes really quickly, one-third researchers to do fundamental research, and one-third product-focused people. And he's like, I love it. Go. And so we put together a dream team. And... Uh, started recruiting, this is actually my office there, they, whenever they do a tour, um, they would bring them by my office because it was so interesting. Like I put this portal together out of a bunch of junk I found on their loading dock. Um, but we were doing all kinds of interesting fundamental research. We were trying to read people's minds with you know, electrodes, we were doing virtual reality, we were doing augmented reality, and um, from that, you know, if any of you have been following, the HTC Vive um, headset came out of that group. And then out of that came an AR startup that I, t I took on. Valve didn't want to do AR, and they actually got rid of the whole AR team, and, and I was gone with it at one point. So I took the technology and actually bought it from uh, Valve Software and launched a startup a few years ago. And uh, it was pretty interesting uh, bootstrapping a tech startup in Washington uh, middle of nowhere. We did it in my co-founder's front room with all of his cats, which was interesting. We're doing complicated optics with cat fur flying everywhere. <laughs> and uh, uh, we put our first prototypes together. Uh, we went around to all the different events that we could to get a bunch of PR going. And uh, all on our own dime, we got a lot of hype going. We actually showed the product working. We did a Kickstarter campaign. We raised a million dollars, you know, in just no time on a Kickstarter campaign and got the, the company going. We moved the company down from Washington out of Rick's uh, front room down to Silicon Valley and uh, went out and I raised $15 million from an investor. And everything's going great. We, we ship our first product, um, the developer kits, out. And then all of a sudden, everything goes sideways. So there's, I've learned a lot about how Silicon Valley works um, being a founder. So it turns out, sometimes you can take too much money. And when you take too much money, there's an expectation that you should grow really fast. And so we took too much money, and the expectation was we need to scale up really fast. And so out goes our leadership. The investors insisted on it. In comes some executives from Disney and Sony to run the company and they crashed it in like six months. And uh, which is really sad, it was a really tough time for me. Uh, meanwhile, I had to sit on the sidelines and watch it happen. But that opened up an opportunity. 
<laughs> um, a, f a friend of mine who I had worked with in the past, he's like, I have this startup that's uh, building low Earth orbit rockets. I can't talk about too much. This is actually public, so I can tell you this much and show you this picture because it's leaked out. He, but he, he said, the guy doing our navigation system, our navigation computers, and our telemetry system uh, just walked out on us and, and I need an ace. And like, you're the person I know can get this done. You have, you know, four months, can you build a navigation system? And I'm like, no, 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 I don't wanna do it. I don't wanna do it. I mean, I love rockets, but no. And he's like, just come up. And this is like a theme in my, <laughs> a theme in my uh, career. Just, just come up and just visit. No obligations. But you got to come up on Thursday. <laughs> like, okay. So I go up on Thursday, and he's like walking me around their facility, and there's like test cells where they're testing rocket engines in it, and there's like that sitting, you know, in the high bay. He's like, oh, you're going to like this next part. Come in here. Takes me into the control room, and it was a test fire day where they test fired the engines. It's like, flames shooting down, the ground shaking, the, the, everything is just thundering, and I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm super proud. Like, in four months, I was able to put the navigation system together for this, and it's flown successfully, and there's going to be another one flying again very soon, and hopefully they'll be public, and you'll be able to hear more about it. Thanks to ham radio, I could have never done this, because... There were no radios on this thing, no transmitters. So, you know, three of us put all the navigation together. I did the telemetry, I did the FPGAs, and, to, and worked with um, the FAA and got it all cleared and, and got the transmitters going. And one guy did the navigation, you know, to keep the thing upright. And uh, the first day we turned all the transmitters on, it was like one carrier. All right, great, see it on the spectrum analyzer. Two carriers, wait, four? I know what that is. So we, we had some inner mod going on, but thanks to ham radio, I immediately identified it. <clears throat> so I had the fortune of being able to buy all my assets back again. So, so in that time that I was working on that rocket, all of the assets from Cast AR, from our brilliant executives, went into auction, and a group of us, employees, pooled our money and we bought the assets. And so I've been able to take all the assets back and start the company back up. I'm super proud. And I've learned a lot as well. A lot of things about, you know, being ethical, right? And how that benefits you. And I, I'm super proud of what I've been able to do in the last year. So when our executives left, they just mic dropped. And they left me holding everything. And I could have just left and not communicated with all of our partners. But I knew that there would be a possible opportunity that I could get this thing going again. So even though it was really uncomfortable, I went to all of our partners and explained the situation, told them my intentions, got yelled out a lot. Like one of our optics partners is based out of Japan. They have a very stuffy guy. The first call I had with him, he's like, you failed me. He, I don't trust you. And just chewing me out, just chewing me out. I'm like, I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry. Uh, I want to fix this. And month after month, phone call after phone call, the same thing every time. Like, I don't trust you. You failed me. You've got to prove it. And I, I softened him up, showed them that we have a new strategy and a new, like, new tenants in the company. It's like it was those guys, not me. I was able to repair that relationship. Then he was able to advocate to our manufacturer. Then I went through a lot of pain with the manufacturer, got them back on board, came up with recovery plans to help everyone that was damaged in the old deal, you know, be able to recover. And I'm, I'm super proud. And I, I feel good that, that there's a opportunities in the world to be like the good person and you don't have to be the skeezy business person. And so, you know, things are going well. We'll, we'll see how it goes. It's, a, it's tough running a startup. But. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
I have to talk a little bit about ham radio, right? Yeah. Sorry, a long story. I hope you guys are staying awake. Um, two years ago, at this conference, came here, did my all three tests in one shot, went straight to extra. It was super fun. Oh, yeah. So, forever, forever, I will have a warm, fuzzy spot in my heart for Pacificon. Yeah. And I've been learning a lot about ham radio too in the last uh, several years as well. And uh, um, I think it's really neat and it's really humbling to think. All my, uh, my, gosh, sorry, I didn't want to get emotional. <laughs> All of the Elmers that helped me out when I was a kid, they're silent keys now. They don't even realize, they never realized that they set in motion me being a ham 20 years later. Right? And I think, I think about that a lot. Like, what we can all do as ham radio operators, kind of, kind of giving that nudge to the youth and our friends, and that it plants the seeds and someday that they'll be ham radio operators or engineers. You know, what can happen with my YouTube channel, like some random kid might stumble onto it and see something that inspires them. So, I think in closing, I think you're not always going to see the fruits of your efforts, but it's so worth it, trust me. I could have never been, you know, an engineer. I could have never worked on rockets. Could have never been a prankster on the phone. <laughs> you know, without you know guidance from ham radio operators and other mentors along the way. So, you know. with that, I think I'm going to wrap it up. I heard one. Did I ever go back to school? No. <laughs> School's for chumps. Unless, <laughs> no, unless, unless you're going to school. There's a lot of... You know, actually, I feel kind of uh, bad sometimes because I'm often uh, asked to come speak at universities and elementary schools, and I kind of skim over the whole part where I drop out of school. Like, I actually think that... School is great. Um, for me, I just accelerated my career much faster by not going to school. And, and really, honestly, you know, even if you go to school, you know, you really get your real lessons the first couple years of your job. And I tell that to a lot of like young engineers that I either hire into my companies or I'm working with in startups. Like, you might feel like you know everything, but really got to get your teeth knocked in a few times and, and get some real world experience. Yeah. What? <laughs> Something about pinball machines. I have about 80, 80 pinball machines. I'm, <laughs> um, yeah, about 25 or 30 are set up in the house, and then all the rest are on the end in a three-car garage. Um, I actually had a pinball route at one point. So, you know, before I went up to Valve Software, my hobby, which was actually a very lucrative hobby, was putting bars in, uh, pinballs in bars. And you'd be surprised how much money you can make, and it fed my hobby of buying pinball machines. But when I moved to Washington, I shut down the... Uh, the pinball routes. Now I've got lots of pinball machines. Actually, I was, I made a, I'm going to sell some of these things so I can make some room. And just last weekend, I bought another one. So. <laughs> so that's, that's no, guess no questions. All right, thank you. I appreciate it.
Jerry, thank you. Inspiring, educational, fun.